Wanna talk? So let's talk. Yeah. Talk. You wanna talk? You gotta talk. You need to talk. News talk. I talk. You talk to Solomon. I talk. You talk to Solomon. Yeah, let's talk to Solomon. Talk, talk, talk to Solomon. Welcome back. According to the exit polls, Scott Walker is going to retain his seat as governor. That's not official. That's just the exit polls. Now, our uh, discussion is between uh, Dr. Alan Keyes, Brent Johnson, and myself. Before I go to Alan to explain his brilliant concept, I'd like uh, Brent to take a second here and tell us uh, how people get a hold of him and about his new show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sam. The show is called The Global Freedom Report. It airs on the Micro Effect Broadcast Network on Saturdays from 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, three full hours of Freedom Talk, and it's heard all around the world. It's also on International Shortwave Worldwide Christian Radio, 9.350 megahertz. That's from 5 to 8 p.m. Saturdays. That's Eastern Time. Uh, you can find out more information about the show, about the work that I do. Uh, get in touch with me by going to www.freedomradio.us, freedomradio.us, or you can give me a call toll-free at 888 888- 385-3733. That's 888-385-FREE. And thanks, Stan, for letting me get that plug in. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. Uh, Dr. Alan Keyes has been known to, frankly, everyone in the United States. He's probably a household word more so than most. Um, and he has a blog called Loyal to Liberty, L-O-Y-A-L-T-O, Liberty, L-I-B-E-R-T-Y, Dot com, and on that site, he has outlined a plan to give America true control over who becomes president, where we don't choose between left and lefter. Uh, Dr. Keith. Well, Stan, I, I just want to point out that these are just ideas that I've put out in the hope that people will revisit what I think was the real purpose and intention of our constitutional system. Uh, because our founders really believed in government of, by, and for the people. Uh, and I say this even though when you look at them as individuals and their situation and so forth, uh, the founding fathers, so-called, included a lot of folks who were elite, right? They were folks who would have been, in their time, considered part of the, quote, quality, the nobility, the gentry, uh, the class that ruled in places like Great Britain. Uh, but rather than establish a form of government that perpetuated rule by the elite, which prevailed pretty much everywhere in the world, they established a government that was based on respecting the capacity of the people to govern themselves. Now, they didn't do this, Stan, because they thought that folks just so were going to turn into wonderful solons and, and paragons of uh, self-government. No, they knew that there were all kinds of difficulties and problems and challenges. But they trusted that the heart of a decent people and the choices of a decent people would provide, if put in the context of the right kind of constitution and moral principle, would provide a government that could, in addition to providing justice and security uh, of, for the rights of the people, would also tap into and unleash the energy and genius of the people in a way that would achieve unparalleled results. And I think that that's exactly been the history of our country, uh, because they had faith in the people. Uh, now, to put it a uh, long story short, I think we are now living with a political process that has abandoned that faith, and political leaders that have abandoned that creed, and that have been systematically seeking to restore in our country government of, by, and for the elites, with the people used and abused as a rubber stamp of their power and for no other purpose. And I think a lot of folks have begun to see through this in our political process. They realize that we are being offered uh, what are essentially Tweedledum and Tweedledumer, Tweedledee and Tweedlediddledee. And the end result is that in the course of my lifetime, with the little hiatus that was represented by the Reagan years, we have seen the country march more further and further to the left until finally 
we hurtle over the abyss into socialism, starting in 2008 with that fateful decision by G.W. Bush and culminating in the absolute and irresponsible orgy of spending and indebtedness and weakening of this country and assault on its moral foundations that has been taking place under Obama. And I think a lot of folks look at this and they know in their heart of hearts that these two parties are essentially two heads on the same body and the feet are moving always, constantly, in the direction of the very kind of government that our founders rejected. Because I know we use terms like socialism and we think it's all about economics. I don't buy that stat. For me, when I look at politics, I look at it in the framework our founders did and that most of the great political philosophers did. And the question is, what's happening to the people and what's happening to the princes? The ambitious few who have throughout human history sought to maintain a stranglehold of power over the people. And when looked at from that point of view, What's been going on in our society is the consolidation of the power and unchallenged control of elites who are now becoming pretty open and naked about the fact that they're just going to kick the people to the curb. We see this in terms of moral issues like the family. We see it in terms of moral issues like abortion. We see it in terms of moral issues like uh, a respect uh, for the decent constraints and restraints that are part of moral understanding. We also see it in economic terms, of course, in the assault on the middle class, in the consolidation of the control of our national income in the hands of little cliques of interest that now amount to fewer and fewer people, cutting off the credit, cutting off the livelihood, destroying the businesses of the mass of people in our country. We understand that this is going on and people are fed up. More and more folks look at these parties and say they don't represent me. More and more folks pulling away from partisanship, looking for an independent way that's going to be based upon what's right for the country. And yet more and more stand finding that there's no outlet for them, no choices made available for them. And I go around the country now and I hear this from a lot of quarters where people are looking at things and say, well, I'm going to hold my nose and vote for so-and-so, but I think he's just as bad as such and such. And I'm thinking to myself, how have we gotten ourselves into this situation? I think the founders would understand it. And so I've written this series on my blog. I wanted people to first consider George Washington's view that, that these parties, factions, this is not a good way to govern. He was not a stupid man. He knew the Constitution. So you look at the Constitution and you find in the process that they put together for the election of the president, I think you find something that epitomizes what they thought would be the way to maintain the control of people at the grassroots over their government, even at the national level. And that's why in the election for president, and th this is something people in the media and uh, in these party elites, they don't like to talk about, and, and in fact, they've put an overlay over the Constitution that completely destroys it. But I, I don't think most people realize the president of the United States is not supposed to be elected directly by the people. That's not supposed to happen. And they thought that if there was that kind of direct election, it would feed demagoguery and faction to a point where the people would be shut out of the process and simply manipulated and deceived by demagogues and elites. And that's exactly what has happened. So to keep control of that process out of the hands of those demagogues, they wanted to have a process where the people would choose from amongst themselves at the grassroots Folks, they trusted to make a choice for President of the United States that would be in the best interest of the country. And, and by the way, Stan, by doing it this way, they also challenge people at the grassroots so that they look around amongst themselves and instead of asking, who's going to do something for me, they're asking, who's going to best represent my will to do something for my country, for my community? for the common good of us all, because that's what the presidency is supposed to epitomize, that unity of the people in the interest and name of the common good of their society and their country. Instead, we've developed a process that's based on gimme politics, where these panderers, unlike the founders, the founders challenged people to be disciplined and to have the strength of conviction in principle that actually required self-discipline and a dedication to an idea of what is good that goes beyond what you're getting from the government 
has nothing to do with that, in fact, because the government isn't supposed to be an instrument that takes care of you. You are supposed to be taking care of yourself. That's what the idea was. And the government is an instrument which you all put together in order to take care of those things that represent the common good and common interest of the whole people, of the whole society, of the whole country. And, and, and especially in terms of the, the federal government. But also in terms of state governments and local governments, the community that's in view when you use the government instrument. Not the good of this or that individual, this or that little clique, this or that little set of cronies of some politician or, 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 or bureaucrat. Uh, so how do you do that? How do you get folks to focus on that? By giving them, empowering them to choose representatives. But then these representatives, Stan, are not supposed to be people who lead them. That was what I was talking about last week. The idea was that the people were the leaders and that they were going to set the tone choosing people who corresponded to their good will for the country, their vision of what was right for the country, their understanding of what was moral and just uh, for their society, and that those people would then go forward. And whether it was representation in the legislature or in the electoral college, as we call it, they were going to represent the heart and decency and good will and character of their people. Now that's been entirely discarded. They've even developed tomes now of social science and all this to tell us that politics is just about a coalition of selfish interests and gimme politics and what have you done for me lately. I wish people would wake up to the fact that all of that is about destroying self-government. It's all about destroying self-government. It's all about turning us into people who don't have the character to govern ourselves so that when we turn all depraved and our society starts to slide into hell, they'll come along and say, well, we have to rule now because you people can't take care of yourselves. If we're going to avoid that fate, Stan, I think we ought to look at the model just so that we can get back into practice that had us electing the president by choosing members of the Electoral College. That is to say, people who were chosen directly by people at the grassroots to represent them in what essentially was a search committee for, for the, the president and the vice president. Uh, and, and that that search committee was going to reflect that sense of what the people thought was necessary for the common good, rather than gimme politics, rather than all of this kind of let's divide up the pie until we finally start dividing up a pie that doesn't exist yet except we burden all future generations with debt and wage slavery. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, they wanted us to act like sovereigns. And they set up the process so that when you were uh, participating in the presidential election, you'd have to take responsibility for your choice. It wasn't going to be somebody whose name you knew and who you understood to have this or that in their background because of lies you'd been told by talking heads in the media who you know you can't trust because they lie to you all the time. No, it wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be done by a grassroots process where you would work on the basis of communities in which you live where you could either derive first-hand knowledge or get knowledge from people who had first-hand knowledge that you talked to. And that that would be the basis for gathering around and lifting up some folks who would then be sent off to that electoral college from your congressional district or whatever district the grassroots were divided up into in order to reach a meeting of the mind about who was going to reflect the common sense and decency and goodwill of their people in service in the presidency of the United States. Well, anyway, that, that, that summarizes the underlying view that I try to present in this series that I called Restoring Representation, a Strategic Proposal. And I think that I would just invite people to go to the blog, read it, uh, and see if both the thinking and the result make sense to you. Now, I didn't try, by the way, stand up, work out all the details and so forth. Why? Because part of the problem with the way people understand politics now is they think leaders are going to be handed to them on a platter. No. See, if somebody's serving you the meal of leadership, that means they've decided what's in that meal according to what they think is right. It suits their taste. It suits their selfish uh, and self-aggrandizing interest. If we want to have leadership that represents us, then that leadership must be like a meal made by the people themselves. And, and, and part of the reason I wrote the way I did was I think people need to get back in the kitchen. And, and all those who are throwing up their hands and saying, it's their party that represents us, I say, okay, 
if Americans go into the supermarket and they don't find the cookie they like or they don't go their kind and a car isn't being made that they like, people who know their business, who know uh, because they've made cookies and made cars and stuff, they'll try to make a better one. Well, you do realize, don't you, that politics is the business of the people. And, and if the people can no longer get into the kitchen and make and lift up the leaders that their country need, then you're no longer going to have government up by and for the people. And, and we don't, by the way. We now have leaders that are made by big money, big corporate interests, big bureaucratic interests, big leftist interests, by Soros and the billionaires and by other folks who are, who are putting fabrications, not even people, you know, consider Barack Obama. Barack Obama isn't, in point of fact, a real individual. He's a fabrication. He's like a fictional character that somebody made up, complete with a fictional background that doesn't even correspond to any facts. And we don't get it yet. That leadership is being made up in the best interest of others. And it's time that we insisted on a politics that we know is going to lift up real leaders because we made them ourselves. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to recommend in this piece. All right. We have just a minute or two to talk about it now, but that was quite an explanation. Uh, bottom yeah. line is people have to get involved. Now, Brent, your thoughts. Yes, I, thank you. I had a couple of things I wanted to add to that. First, as a reminder, we've talked about it before. I think it was Ben Franklin who said that the system that was set up was set up for a just and moral people. It is insufficient to any others. The reason we have a breakdown in our system is because we do not have a just and moral people, not just in government, but in society itself. Restore justice and morality, and the system itself will correct itself. The other thing is the comment about leaders uh, was very, very well spoken, Alan. Uh, a couple of years ago, I conducted a, an interview with Congressman Ron Paul, the Patriot Congressman, and I asked him, I said, Ron, do you think that your colleagues in the Congress consider themselves to be rulers or public servants. And his response was that while he didn't think it was malicious in most cases, they thought of themselves as rulers. Therein lies the problem. They think of themselves as our leaders and they should be thinking of themselves as our servants. Along with that thought process comes humility and along with the humility comes limitations on government powers. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to add those two elements, but the one element you missed, Alan, I'm sure you know about it, okay, but you just didn't mention it, is that the original founding fathers and the original framers of the Constitution not only believed that the president was not to be an elected position, but they also did not believe that their, the president should be elected on party tickets. You didn't vote for a Democrat president and vice president, or a Republican president and vice president. To the contrary, when the Electoral College met, the number one vote getter would be president. The number two vote getter, who was normally from a different party, would be vice president. This would put a split in the White House that was designed to create an additional check and balance in the executive branch. We've completely lost sight of that. We now get into these slates, you know, vote all Democrat, vote all Republican, vote all whatever, and such, and it completely takes away from the system that was supposed to be in place, that we're supposed to have in a just and free society. Well, I, uh, if I can comment, I, I think that's exactly right. And the, the sign of it was, and this is very important, if pe people will go to my blog, loyaltoliberty.com, read through the series. I will very soon, by the way, be making it available as a, as a pamphlet so people can just have it and download it all of a piece and read it through and, and, and consider and ponder it. But what was important, and, and it's along the lines uh, of what was just said, is the electors were chosen as individuals, right? So you went to the polls and there would be a list of names and you would have to choose who you wanted to be an elector from your district, who you wanted to be that person or persons who would be chosen from your district to go and make the decision about who was going to be president. Uh, and, and that then was going to reflect your knowledge of whether those people you were choosing from your area actually represented your understanding, your decency, your desires for your community and your nation. It wasn't done through this campaign of self-aggrandizement and phony hype, 
that has now substituted for what's supposed to be the first deliberation of the people directly at the grassroots, which is not about the person who should be president. It's about the people right there where they live who ought to be representing them in the choice for president. And that's something you can take responsibility for. Can't foist it off on the media who lied to you and so forth. And you have to get out there and do the necessary groundwork so that you'll have some basis for making that decision yourself. That's step number one. And in the, the proposal, I actually look at how we can take the way things are presently done and turn them into something that then has the people involved in just that way in choosing the slate of electors and in putting that slate of electors forward in a way that then allows a group of like-minded electors to be the majority elected on November 6th. Not from parties and partisanship, but from the common sense, heart, and decency of people working in their own districts, but holding hands throughout the country on the basis of a set of common principles and common goals and desires for the country. And using that set of common principles and goals as the sort of guidelines for the search committee, the folks, if they elect that majority, would then look through the whole country, not just self-serving politicians saying, I want to be this and I want to be that. You'd have a chance. The, the, the founders admired a, a, the example in Roman history of a guy called Cincinnatus, who was called from behind the plow on his farm to take over leadership of the republic in time of need. Not somebody who was d always involved in and pushing himself and all of this, but somebody who was just tending to his own affairs, but who was decent and competent and had displayed his abilities in dealing with the very crisis they were dealing with uh, 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 before that, and they turned to him. You know we can't do that in this country? The system we've evolved would not allow the people of this country to lift up somebody who was just right for the crisis that they were in. We only are going to be given the choices of the folks who have caused the crisis, and they're going to tell us that's good enough. And it's just not. Well, see, the founders didn't think we should settle for that. And if we look at the Constitution, and if we work with what's there, it would still be possible between now and Election Day for folks to put together slates committed to the restoration of our common principles of the Declaration and of moral justice and decency and of constitutional understanding respecting the words of the Constitution instead of abandoning them. We could put it together an electoral majority committed to those things who would then be sworn to find throughout this country a couple of individuals, one for president, one for vice president, who would do that and who would be sworn to do it, not sworn to serve the little cliques and corporate interests and billionaires who put them into place. Uh, and I think that kind of deep grassroots populism but conducted in a responsible way that requires the real participation of people willing to go to some trouble to find out who best represents them in their own community. I think that that is a model of what our founders thought would be the best virtue of self-government. Uh, and it's still there. And, and the one thing I would say in addition to what Brad said, I believe there's still a decent majority in this country, God-fearing people who are doing their best to raise decent kids and do a decent job of work and they want to live in a decent country. Uh, and, and I think that this whole partisan system has been betraying their decency and they need to withdraw from it and find a way to come together. And as my book title says, this uh, series is really the last chapter to a book that I called And Crown Thy Good, which is to say look around, form a coalition of decency, and from amongst the people who are committed to that ideal of the country's good, lift up those who truly represent the heart of the people for that good. Uh, and I think it's time we restored that understanding of our politics, and I think we could do it in this election year. There's enough unhappiness with what's going on that if people took the 21st century instruments that we have for networking and, and communicating with one another and put them to work, they'd be able to achieve this result. Uh, and I couldn't tell you how they're going to do it. Not exactly. I can set out a goal like that. But you know the beautiful thing about Americans? If they have a clear goal, they will find a better way to do it than you or I or anybody would have thought of on our own. And that's what the genius of the American people our founders used to talk about. Our elites have been trying to suppress and destroy it. We need to restore it. All right, on that note, we're going to say good night, uh, but we're going to continue this discussion next week. Uh, so, folks, certainly be here for that. Brent Johnson, thank you for being with us. 
Uh, Alan Keyes, as always, a, always a pleasure, uh, an inspiring Thank uh, you, Brett. discussion. And uh, folks, uh, go to Loyal to Liberty, read about this, and you can participate next week when we get back together uh, and have this discussion. Alan, I'm going to invite you on the show. All right, I'll make sure you have oh, all the contact information, Brent, if, if you don't have it already. All right, good night, everyone. Thanks for being with Talk to Solomon.